<laughs> hey, good morning, church. It is great to be with you, and happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I just want to just take a moment just to recognize and uh, acknowledge that freedom isn't free. And we have the wonderful ability to gather without persecution here together to worship Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice of millions of Americans, a million since the Civil War. And so uh, we just want to say thank you to all of our, our fallen veterans, their families, their friends, many people that have served and lost friends in the military. We, we just honor those who, who gave their life for our freedom, and uh, we just say thank you this morning. Um, yeah, that's, that's good to <laughs> applaud. But even more than that, there's a, a savior of the world. His name is Jesus Christ, and he has given his life once and for all. And scripture says that without the shedding of blood, that uh, no forgiveness of sins can take place. And so it is by his blood that we are free. It's because of Christ, just like we sang, because of Christ, I am alive. And so I'm just so grateful, eternally grateful to Jesus Christ who gave his life for me. And if you don't know that redeeming grace this morning, that's our prayer is that this morning that you would just come to know Jesus, you'd come to know his presence. It would change you, it would set you free and that you'd experience that freedom and forgiveness this morning. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. How many knew that? Rolling into church. Hey, good. And we got some Pentecostals in the house. Um, which simply, uh, Pentecost simply just means 50. And uh, 50 days after Passover, after Easter. And uh, we, we read about uh, Pentecost Sunday in, in uh, church just a few weeks ago. Pastor Jeff and Pastor Weaver spoke a message. So if you missed that, go back to our YouTube channel find that, but I want to just read about what happened on the day of Pentecost, what happened to this body of believers in Acts chapter 2. We've been in this better series looking at uh, how life is better with the Spirit of God in us and full in us, and Acts chapter 2 describes this event that took place in the upper room, and verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or languages as the Spirit enabled them. This outpouring of God's Holy Spirit set in motion and it birthed the early church. We are finishing our series of better. And this morning, uh, the title of my sermon and Pastor Jeff's is A Better Church. A Better Church. And uh, I, I, uh, I think that New Hope is a pretty great church. How many, how many enjoy New Hope? Keep your mouth shut if you don't. Okay. Um, but I, I, think that, uh, I, I think that we've got a pretty great church. And I'm probably a little bit biased in my opinion, but I'm also not uh, ignorant to the fact that New Hope could be a better church. It could be a better church. And uh, I, I want to define what I mean by this. Because when I talk about church, church is more than a building. It's more than our pretty flowers. It's more than Sunday school. It's more than singing songs and worshiping God. It's more than a pastor. It's more than a pulpit. It's more than preaching. A church is people. And so when I say a better church, what I'm really saying this morning is a better people. A better people who are unified by the spirit of God that comes in them and places in a love for one another. A spirit of unity where it says we are in this together of one purpose, of one mind, where we are declaring the work of the cross to the utmost ends of the earth. That's why we have missions. That's why we are evangelistic. That's why we do what we do. We are one and we are better when we are full of the Holy Spirit. And so what makes New Hope wonderful is the people. And I'll, I'll, I'll say this, maybe I should rephrase that a bit. What makes New Hope wonderful is the Lord shining through people. Because it's not just people, it's not just you in yourself that makes New Hope's great, it's Christ in you. May I never boast in anything except the cross of Jesus Christ, right? We just sang that this morning. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And so I know that as long as there is breath in my lungs and as long as 
I am still a part of this, this church and I still attend this church, the Lord's not finished with me, making me better. Turn to your neighbor and say, he ain't done with him yet, okay? And now turn to your other neighbor and say, he ain't done with you yet, right? He's not done with us. And uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that Jesus said it's better that he goes away and he places his spirit inside of us to guide us and to help us become that. Today, our sermon text is in Acts chapter two, towards the end, verse 42. And we're going to read and see what a Holy Spirit church, uh, a Holy Spirit filled church really looks like. And I would just encourage you as we read this, allow the spirit of God to speak to you. Is this the way that I operate? Does this describe me? Is this describing my current reality? Or is there some work that is needed for the Spirit of God to come in and, and, uh, and change me? So Acts chapter 2, verses 42. Peter's just preached. People have been adding to their number. It's been this incredible encounter. And we see this in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay, they. Who is they? This is the, the believers. These are people who have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. This is the early church. This is the first start of the, the church. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. And I need your help this morning. I need your, your spirit to fill me, to equip me, to, to speak in this service. And for those joining online, exactly what you want to communicate. God, I pray that you would continue to refine in, in my life as we study your word. And it's quickened by your spirit. So I just pray just a blessing and that you would just have your way in, in this service and in our hearts. Give us supernatural ability to not fall asleep with this boring old preacher in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not old. I hope I'm not boring, but uh, we are, we're excited that, uh, that you're here. Looking at our text today, I think there's four characteristics that give us an outline of what a spirit-filled church should look like. Now, remember, when I say church, I'm talking about people, not a building. So a spirit-filled church, a better church, should be a learning church. That's point one. Verse 42 says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves to the teachings. They were a learning church. Note that these new converts were not enjoying a mystical experience which led them to despise the mind or disdain theology. Anti-intellectualism and the fullness of the Spirit are mutually incompatible. What do I mean by that? Being full of the Spirit leads us actually to being intellectual. It's the Spirit of truth when he comes into us. They, they go hand in hand. We don't check our brains at the door every time that we walk through here. We, we use our brains to worship God. What does Jesus say? As he quotes the Shema in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter six, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. We use our brains, we are intellectual. We don't just assume and just say, well, it just takes faith, brother. It just takes faith. Anybody had that cop out thing? There are times where we walk by faith and not by sight. But I believe that God has given us plenty of evidence to know intellectually that he is risen that he is Lord, and we can know intellect, and, and a spirit-led church is, is a church that is full of the spirit of God, and then what that does is it cements in our mind what we know to be true when we experience it. There's this experiential side. Back in uh, Systematic Theology 1, okay, I know that was everybody's favorite class that everybody took, um, Systematic uh, Theology 1, I remember my professor talking about the Wesleyan quadrilateral. Anybody ever heard that? 
It's not, yeah, there are some people, but there, it, it's not like a scientific thing. Um, it's, it sounds very intimidating to me. I remember him writing Wesley in quadrilateral, and I was like, I'm out, you know? But I remember him drawing a square on the board, and, and it was this, this uh, way that John Wesley, a great preacher, uh, you know, moved, moved in, in might and church revival, he, he talked about how do you get sound theology? And at the top of this square that he drew on the board was scripture. Scripture is the primary source of sound theology. How many know that to be true? You use scripture to interpret scripture. We do not just pluck and pull from scripture to make a thought work. We use scripture to interpret scripture. So scripture is the baseline, it's primary. But then on the other side of this square, he, he wrote tradition and then experience and then reason. And, and he talked about how in the center of all of this, we use tradition, we, 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 we use reason, we use experience to, to solidify what we are drawing conclusions within the text. And at the center of this square is where we find true, tested, tried, and true good theology. If we lean too much to experience, that could lead to some really bad theology. Anybody sat under that before? Right? If we lean too much to tradition, that could lead to some not good things. You look at the Catholic Church and different things that were traditional, or even, I'm sure that even now in the Assemblies of God, there's some golden cows of tradition that need to come down. And it can lead to not good theology. And if we, if we lean only on reason and intellect, it's short. It comes short. We need all of them to, to gather. And so what, what did looking, or what did it look like that the, uh, these early church believers were devoted to the teachings of the apostles? Well, it, it says in verse 42, uh, or in vo- verse 46, that every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Now, there's been some people, this is a horrible idea just as a pastor, I'm just gonna tell you, but there's some people who say, well, we should have church every single day. Like, that sounds exhausting to me, okay? <laughs> Please don't put that on your pastor. Um, but, but let's, let's understand why they were meeting in the temple. We are blessed where we have printed Bibles, where they didn't. Where were the scriptures? In the temple, right? How could they devote themselves to the teachings of God while not being around the word of God? Now we've got phony Bibles, right? We, we've got paper Bibles. How many own more than one Bible? We are not confined to intellectually worshiping our Lord by coming to the church. We, we can worship at a coffee shop. How many do coffee Bible studies, right? You go to Friedrichs and it's just like a, a Jesus revival in there sometimes. It's like you can't even get a table because you got women's group of whatever, whatever, you know, studying the word of God, which I love and it's great, but then they're loitering at some point, you know, like, you know, like <laughs> let someone else get some coffee, right? Um, but, but we, we uh, as, as, a, 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 as a 21st century you know, church, we have access to the word of God. We've got things like the church provides of right now media where we can do Bible studies. We have homes that facilitate more than just an immediate family and we're not just in a cave and we're all tight. We don't have to gather at the temple course. Now, should you be at church? Yes, we should be at church to edify others. Let us not forsake assembling as the day draws near, but let us gather together that we might build each other and encourage each other as the day of judgment comes forward. Yes, we come together, we, we gather, but, but let me tell you this, we have the word of God. Ask yourself, are you fully devoted to the word of God in your life? What does that look like for you? Are you opening up the word of God and truly giving the time and the attention that it deserves or is it distracted? You have your phone notifications of ESPN, bump, 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 going off during your Bible time. Are, are, are you actually diving into the word of God? If you need to find a, a, a good Bible commentary, come and talk to me. I, I can point you in for about a hundred bucks. You can get a good Bible commentary that comes along. The Fire Bible which is the Assemblies of God Study Bible. That is a phenomenal uh, Bible and a phenomenal resource. In fact, Pastor Kerry had a big part of revising that, and he he wrote that. We call him Fire Bible Kerry around here. Kerry, you're welcome. You can can call Pastor Kerry Fire Bible Kerry. He's like, thanks, Austin. I appreciate that. 
But um, it, it is great. Are you studying the word of God? And, and don't let that question glaze over your mind. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Legitimately, right now. When was the last time this week that you opened up the word of God and you really allowed the spirit of truth and the word of God to penetrate and cut your heart like a double-edged sword like it's supposed to? Could you tell me what you read this week in the word of God? If you cannot, then this message is for you. Devote yourselves to the word of God, to the teachings. Listen, Sunday school is a big part of this, and we don't have Sunday school today, so it feels kind of weird that I'm hit, ringing the Sunday school bell, and then we've got a holiday weekend, which we give our teachers breaks. Um, you know, it takes a lot to, to do this, but we don't have Sunday school just, just for the sake of having Sunday school. We have Sunday school so that you might love God better with your mind. I don't know about you, but when I discover something new in Scripture or something fresh in Scripture or I begin to develop a greater theology and understanding of who God is, it leads me to worship. It leads me to praise. It leads me to generosity. It leads me in this way. And I would just assume rather like having a, a Bible study where I like don't get me a fiery preacher that's just, you know, just yelling at me and stuff. Like, let me learn about God. And that, that makes my heart come alive. Are, are we devoted? Most people don't need another night of the week for a small group or different things. How many feel overloaded already? Just honestly, you just feel overloaded in life. Really? I'm the only one? You guys are a bunch of liars, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't mean to call you guys a bunch of liars. Um, but we don't need, uh, you know, another Thursday or another Tuesday or another Friday. Why can't we just say, I'm going to devote an extra hour on Sunday? I think we could all afford one extra hour on Sunday and say, we are going to be a church that is devoted to the teachings and the preachings of Jesus Christ. And in those moments, it's beautiful. Last week, there was a, a girl in our, our Sunday school class and she was talking about how she was struggling getting her MS under control and this new medicine was kicking her butt. And you know what we did? We laid hands on her and we prayed for her and it was a powerful, emotional, spirit-filled moment in a Sunday school class. That's the power. If you're just showing up and you're just taking from church, that's not what it's about. Church is not about what we get. It's about what we give to God and it's what we give to others. You guys understand? The second thing we see is that... A spirit-filled church is a loving church. In verse 42, it says that they are devoted to fellowship. And in verses 45 and 46, it says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You, you know what the Spirit of God does in your life as he fills you? He, he places within you a love for all people that then manifests itself in unity. What is unity? Preferring other people in love. What is unity? Saying, I, I, I love you even though you are different than I am. What is unity? Saying, hey, let's, let's set down our differences and let's just focus on Christ today. What's unity? Saying, Man, we are, we are together, and even though you vote this way and I vote this way, we can agree about Jesus Christ. E even though you look at it this way and I look at it this way, and, and, and you like um, you know, this type of music and you like that type of music, we can agree that it's all about Jesus. Unity by the Spirit of God, which then is birthed and manifests itself in love and loving for each other. People don't just sell their property to give to other people unless there's love in their heart. Like, that's a supernatural love. I'm not gonna sell my home or my car or my possessions to give to someone else unless there's love in my heart. And the Spirit of God is the only person who can place that love in us. If you struggle with being generous, ask God to pour out his Spirit into your heart so that you might release, have a release in you, this desire to truly love your neighbor as yourself. Just this past week, there was a, a mom from this church who, who reached out and she was uh, in, in need. Um, she was throwing a, a grad party for her son and for her son's uh, friend. And this friend just recently, within the last two weeks, unexpectedly lost his father. And so this mom called me and she's like, hey, I, I need some help with this party because I told this mom who's now widowed that I would take care of the party, but I've got a bruised foot and I've got 
ankle problems and I don't know how I'm gonna do this and I'm feeling overwhelmed all of it. Uh, uh, mo- and, uh, uh, in this moment, good grief. Um, and, and I just don't know how I'm gonna do this. And you know what I did? I called their Sunday school class teacher because in Sunday school is where you build relationships. And they got on the phone and there were several people that came throughout the day Friday to help set up, to help decorate, to help tear down, to help replenish food, to help do all of these different things. And it was beautiful. In in fact, one of the the ladies uh, sent this in a message, said, hey there, we were planning to leave for Minnesota that night, Friday night, this just, just past Friday. However, I talked it over with my husband and it's okay that we leave Saturday and said, I feel it's really important to help bless these families during this difficult time, so I'm in. Let me tell you this, that is a supernatural love placed in that person's heart for someone else that they're in community with. You don't give up your Friday night of Memorial Weekend and, and delay your plans and going and seeing family without a supernatural love. And I could tell you story after story of people doing wonderful things out of the genuine love of God that God has placed in their hearts. I, I wanna ask you this. When you see people around the church, is, is your heart well up with love for them or, or is there like, um, just like they're just another person? If you saw someone crying or or looking down or depressed, are you gonna stop and and check on them? Or is it just like, oh man, we should probably get a pastor over there. They look like a wreck this morning. When you see people worshiping down at the chapel, is your heart welled up with thankfulness and gladness that they too are at church and they too are receiving the word of God and they too are blessing their children? Or is is there just like, uh, uh, uh. Man, unity is found only in Jesus Christ. It's it's all about him. It's all about him. This past Thursday, I went up to uh, Northwest Iowa. One of my my best friends, they're probably watching online, uh, Brian Bartman, his dad. We've been praying for him in the bulletin and the prayer list. Gary Bartman was diagnosed with cancer January 20 and was just placed on in-home hospice just uh, about a week ago. And Brian asked me if I would go up and visit with the family. I'm very close with the Bartmans. And uh, we were there for about eight hours. It's about a four hour drive up there. It's about as far northwest as you could get. Not not, uh, a good smelling drive either. (laughs) A lot of cattle and pigs and that stuff. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the sermon um, (laughs) or the point that I'm trying to make. But I'm up there and over the course of about eight hours on Thursday that we were at their house just helping out and just being with them, I would say that there was eight to nine different people that stopped by their house and they brought cookies, which I partook bread of, and they, they, they brought food, they brought, you know, like a, they call it hot dish, but like a casserole. There was people who came over to help in the flower garden, there's people coming the next day to mow, and guess what? They were all from their church. And I thought to myself, what a loving church. What what type of love is this? Man, is the love of God just well up in your heart for the brother? You look around right now. Do you genuinely love the people around you? I can tell you this, sometimes it takes just a little bit of intentionality to get to know a person where then you can love them. There's people that I, uh, growing up, you know, here in this church, or I didn't really know them, and they were kind of prickly, you know what I'm saying, just a little prickly, and I was like, I don't know if I like them, but then I took the time to get to know them, and they're some of my favorite people, even though they've got a little bit of prickles, you just know how to take them. (laughs) How many just are a self-professed prickly person, right? Yeah, my dad, okay. <laughs> There's a couple of people in the back. You're honest. Can I, can I just uh, challenge us? Let's, let's be loving. Let's be known for being a loving church. And, and in this passage, you know, it's not just about them loving each other at the temple, but in, in, they ate together with gladness in their homes. They broke bread together in their homes. And you don't eat with gladness with someone unless you truly love that person. I wanna challenge everyone here and, and write this down, remember it, make note of this, 
But I challenge everyone here at some point this summer to have at least one person into your home, into your apartment, into your dwelling place, and break bread together with gladness. That is church. This isn't church. This is part of church. That is church. That is loving God. And then at that time, you know, where you're eating bread, is there anything that I can pray for you and your life, your family? Is there anything that's going on? And take the time to make it about Christ. Let's build relationships centered around Christ and let's break bread together. The third evidence of the spirit-filled church is that they were a worshiping church. Verse 47 says that they were praising God. Why were they praising God? Well, I'm sure some of it was because of the signs and wonders that, that they were experiencing. How, how many have ever witnessed a miracle and it's just hard not just to lift your voice and clap your hands and shout hallelujah, right? right I, I think that we should be seeing more of that. We should be, we should be experiencing that. And, and if you've got a testimony, whether you're watching online or you're here, would you let us know so that we can glorify God in it? It doesn't matter who prayed for you. It doesn't matter all the details. It's, it's about giving glory to Jesus Christ. And so they're praising God because of the, the evidence of his, his uh, works. But could it have been that their eyes were open to the scriptures? And, and as they were studying the scriptures in the temple and how their eyes were illuminated to how all the Old Testament was pointing towards Christ, that they began to praise God. I know, and I, I shared this just a minute ago, that when I see something new in scripture, it leads me to praise when, when, I, when God reveals something, and it's not new, like this new groundbreaking theology, it's just, it's just a different take on it. It's just something I haven't noticed. And it's just thank you, Jesus, for that reminder. How, how can you not praise God when reading about his mercy and grace? How can you not praise God when you think about all that he has done for you? It reminds me of an older song. Um, I believe Hillsong did it. When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all the glory and all of the honor and all of the praise. Man, when we think about God, when we gather together, it leads us and we become a worshiping people. We become a people that praise God. When the spirit of God fills your heart and your mind, you can't help but praise him. Can I, I let you in, this is just a little bit vulnerable here, but in on a little secret. When I lead worship, I try to keep my eyes shut as much as possible. And I understand that not everybody can do that. You know, we sang a beautiful new song this morning that was all about Jesus Christ, about Golgotha's tree his mercy speaking for us, his mystery. You know, so I understand you can't close your eyes if you don't know the song, but, but when I close my eyes, it helps me just truly focus on him and him alone. And I don't have to know the melody, I don't have to know the words, but I can worship him with my mind and my heart and my spirit. And when I close my eyes, I'm not looking out and seeing anyone who might be disengaged. It is beyond my understanding of how someone who has been saved and redeemed and forgiven can stand dull in his presence. We don't have to become undignified in worship, but we should never become dull in our worship. When we truly remember what he has done for us, it demands a response. And, and I understand there's some people who are just like, well, you want me to raise my hand? I don't want to raise my hand. Look, I'm not going to force anybody to raise their hand. But if you're not thinking about Christ or you're just standing around and just looking, like, why do we gather? We gather to worship the Lord. He is worthy, is he not? He demands our praise. Some of the most incredible times of worship were the times of worship where I didn't know what was going on in the service. I remember last year when I was in Tanzania and I didn't know any of the words except for hallelujah. That's the only, that's like the universal hallelujah. You know, you're down in Central America, hallelujah. They're like, hallelujah, you're in Africa, hallelujah. And they're like, bah, 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 bah. and you're like, I've got no idea what you're saying, but hallelujah, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. And when it's all about Jesus, 
The Spirit unifies us, says, man, it doesn't matter all of these things. We have made worship about us. A- ask yourself if you've made worship about you. Well, I don't know the songs. I don't like the songs. I don't know the melody. I prefer this. I want that. When worship is all about who? Jesus Christ. And, and I say this with love in my heart, but I, I, I truly believe that I walk a, a good line of being able to say, man, there's songs that I just don't plumb care for, but I can still extract the truth of the song and worship God with my mind, even though it sounds like a yuppie Hillsong Young and Free stuff. And there's other times where we sing a hymn that sounds older than my grandma's grandma, and I can just extract the truth and try to make sense of the thys and the vows and the, you know, the ancient literature, and I can worship God intellectually and appreciate that this is ministering to people. It's about Jesus Christ. When did it ever become about us? God, would you just right now just fill us and convict us that every moment that we step foot into this sanctuary, that it would not be about any person on the platform, it would not be about any song that we like, it wouldn't be about whatever the trims and the toppings, God. I pray that it would be about you, that you would be glorified and only you for all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Help us, God, to make us one in worship. The last thing, and we're just about done here, is a spirit-filled church should be an evangelistic church. We've got a learning church, a loving church, a worshiping church, but an evangelistic church. Verse 47 says that the Lord added to their number daily. They didn't wait till they went through Mission 101, even though Mission 101 is a good thing, and if you haven't been through that, you should go through that because you will learn and you'll grow, but they didn't, they didn't wait until they were confirmed or even some of them baptized. They, they don't look to Peter to do all the work. They don't look to the apostles to do all the evangelistic work. They don't look to social media and how are you marketing and advertising and all of these different things. A spirit-filled church is evangelistic at its core. The spirit himself is evangelistic. It says that, that no man comes to the Father unless who draws him in? The Spirit draws him in. That is an evangelistic spirit moving in and reaching and snatching people from death and hell and the grave and bringing them to life in the fullness in the Spirit. When you experience something as sweet as the presence of God, you can't help but tell other people about it. You can't help but tell other people about it. I want new hope to grow. I really do. I want New Hope to have massive influx of new believers, but I want the growth to be for the right reason. I would hope that when someone talks about New Hope, when someone starts to to begin to talk about New Hope, that, that has more to do with encountering the presence of Jesus and glorifying Jesus than it has to do with your pastors. If you're saying, hey, you should come to our church because our pastors are great. Pastor Weaver's the best. Pastor Jeff is the best. Oh, it's just so good. They've got such good children's ministry. Pastor Courtney's just wonderful. Oh, they've got such good youth ministry. Oh, man, they've got a choir and orchestra still. Praise God. You know, they've they've still got that. And they've, they've got things where there's Sunday school. No, can we just make it about Jesus? I I want people to encounter the changing presence of Jesus. When you are in his presence, you cannot leave the same. He will purify you. He'll he'll place in you this desire, this, this life that comes in abundance that he promises to us. This, this church is not great because of the pastors. This church is not great because we've got the wonderful musicians or anything else. This church should be great because Jesus should be glorified. When, when you talk about New Hope, my prayer is that you'd say, you know what, they're not perfect, they do a lot of things well, but man, they are focused on Jesus Christ. You know why you get to hear from about seven different preachers in this pulpit? Because from the beginning of time, humanity struggles with glorifying man and putting men on, on high horses and, and, and on platforms and following people rather than Jesus. Some, some, some of you don't like that because you tell us, I wish you would speak all the time, Pastor Weaver. The, the, the other guys are good. I'm not complaining or anything. 
But man, just Pastor Weaver, you've just got that special anointing. You know, if the, the message being preached from this pulpit is about Jesus Christ, I don't care who preaches. Man, woman, white, black, brown, it doesn't matter. It's about Jesus. Our eyes are on Jesus. I truly believe that the reason why there was explosive growth in this early church is because their eyes were completely on Jesus. I mean, they had waited how long for the Spirit of God to come upon them? Man, revival, revival comes with a little bit of a cost. And not, not a little bit of a cost, it comes with your life. You wanna have personal revival in your life, man, it, it comes with laying it down, saying, not my will, but thy will be done. I, I truly believe the reason why they saw explosive growth was because they were devoted to praying and they were seeing miracle after miracle. God doesn't need help looking good. God doesn't need our help. He just wants a platform to be who he is, to be on display, healer, redeemer, deliverer, prince of peace. And in the coming weeks, Pastor Kerry was just talking with the executive team and he's gonna be talking about prayer nets and, and about evangelizing our neighborhoods. And it sounds scary and intimidating, but really it is the most practical, tangible, easiest way to glorify God. Diane, would you come to the keyboard and we're gonna end church a little bit different this morning. And I, it is my heart that God is put on display at New Hope for the next 33 years for the next 66 years. It's, it hasn't been about a person. People try to make it about a person, but it's not about a person. And dad, I wanna publicly commend you for being spirit led years ago, 10 years ago of saying, man, people are growing attached to me and there's gonna be a transition because you ain't grown younger, you know? And you had the wisdom and the foresight to say, it's not about me, it's about Christ. And you've beautifully and masterfully put this transition plan into effect where Pastor Jeff came alongside you and now there's a team of pastors and it's not about one of us. I never want it to be about me. I never want it to be about Jeff. I never want it to be about anyone. And so I thank you publicly for, for you being sensitive and not egotistical in the sense that many senior pastors are where they need to be in the pulpit 46 Sundays a year. It's about Jesus. Thank you. But even more than that, I want people, when they step into this sanctuary, to encounter the realness of his presence. Some of you have yet to experience it, and you've been attending church for many years, and you're just like, I don't get why they get emotional. I don't get why I get emotional, but the only time I get emotional is when I'm in the presence of God. It's the only time, I, and I don't say that pridefully, that's just who I am, I'm like my mom. A little bit more stable than my dad, you know? <laughs> but I want people, when they walk into the presence of God, that the demons that attack them and oppress them and have them pinned down Monday through Saturday, that when they set foot on our beautiful lawn and our beautiful parking lot and the beautiful building, that those demons would just have to stop and they just shed off like a snake shedding its skin I, I want us to, to pray boldly in Sunday school classes and I believe that God could heal this woman of MS there's been another woman in our church that was healed of it she was wheelchair bound and now she's walking running and laughing that's not because of anything that's happened here that's because of the person of Jesus Christ who's alive so this is how we're gonna end today. And I, I really believe this. I'm putting God, you on the, the, the spotlight, but we're gonna end praying for one another. And then next week, the assignment is to try to find that person or if you have their number, you text them and you ask them, did God show up? Did God do a miracle? And if he hasn't yet, then you keep on praying for them. But wouldn't it be wonderful if New Hope was known for a place that people were healed, set freed, and delivered? I've been trying to read through the Gospels and the book of Acts once a month, four chapters a day. Four chapters a day, it'll get you through Matthew, 
through Acts in, in one month. And I am just blown away that everywhere Jesus went, there was deliverances, there was freedoms, there were people that are, are coming alive. There's just miracles that flow. And when you read about Acts chapter two, the signs and the wonders and the different things, new hope, let's make it about Jesus. Let's give God opportunity to do that. So real quick, we're gonna end in a time of prayer, but before we do that, would just every eye closed and head bowed. And you're here this morning and you say, Austin, I feel like the Lord was speaking to me about being a learning church and I need to engage more intellectually and put my mind and my attention, not on researching different products or different things, but on the person of Jesus Christ. And you say, I need to become a learning church. I need to become a learning person. We just raise your hand, I wanna pray for you, yeah. If you're here and you say, man, I struggle with just truly loving all people. I'm really good at loving people that look like me, that think like me, that are, are like me. But man, I, I, I need the love of God that is just supernatural. And you just say, that's you this morning, just in a, a spirit of humility. Yeah, 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 yes. Thank you, Jesus, placing us that love. And this morning you say, I've been guilty of observing during worship when it's all about you. I've been guilty of a critical spirit or, or a preference spirit where it's become about this or that or how it's mixed or this or whatever. And then just say, I just want it to be about you. It's not about who's leading. It's not about that. And you say, I'm here to worship. And I just say this morning, I declare I'm going to worship every time I set foot in new hope. And you just say, that's me this morning. And you say, yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Help us, Lord, to make it about you. And lastly, you say, I need to be more evangelistic and not by my own might, not by my own power, but I'm just simply committing to pray for my neighbors, pray for my coworkers, my family members, and put God on display. Allow him to work in only the way that he can work. And you say, that's me. I need to do a better job of reaching and being evangelistic, a spirit that is evangelistic. So Jesus, you see every response, you see every heart. And this morning, God, by your spirit and only by your spirit, I pray that in this time of ministry, just as your word describes, Describes, where iron sharpens iron, where person edifies or builds up other people, God, I pray that miracles would happen. I pray for physical things to happen this morning. I pray emotionally. There's a lady that has been set free of depression that she has had since she was a child, over 20 years of depression. And I pray that there'd be more testimonies, more miracles, all in the name of Jesus for your glory, and that God, you would bring in the hurting. You would bring in the broken. We would go to the highways and the byways and it wouldn't matter what they look like, what they smell like, how they talk, but we would bring them in to the family of God and we would love them and we would love them well. And so Jesus, place your spirit inside of us that we might be a better church, a better people. In Jesus' name, amen. We're